ladies and gentlemen, this is Gaming Silicon video. We're going to be discussing AMD's Polaris architecture as well as some stuff regarding Zen from the perspective of the CEO of the company, Dr. Lisa Su. Then we're going to be moving over to high bandwidth memory too, because JDEC have recently updated some of the specifications on the hardware. So we're going to start out with Dr. Lisa Su's comments. They are to computerbase.de, which is a German website. So I am needing to run some stuff through Google Translate. Luckily for us, most of the comments are certainly not ambiguous. And to be honest with you, they are being pretty damn boastful for their plans, which is, you know, kind of what you do for PR. So 2016 is going to be a good year, uh, begins Dr. Lisa Sue. I don't know why I keep saying Dr. Lisa Sue. It's kind of, I guess you could say without saying at this point, I guess I could just say Lisa or Sue or anything else. Anyway, the target for the Polaris architecture, as we've known for some time, is mid-2016, but they are focused at the moment at back-to-school season. So, theoretically, um, this is not just going to be for desktop solutions. AMD are also hoping to do this for notebooks as well, which is kind of cool. It means, theoretically, we should be getting much more than just a paper launch. This means that if you don't want any um, reading between the lines, theoretically, Polaris should launch before September. And it, once again, if AMD managed to keep on with this schedule, means that in around six months-ish, I'm obviously slightly rounding up here, we should all be knowing exactly what High Bandwidth Memory 2 is going to be bringing to the table, and really, how we stand and what is going to you know, what AMD are going to be able to bring to the next generation of GPUs. We've known quite a bit um, in terms of what they've hoped to accomplish in terms of perform performance for what, you know, regarding slides. But I guess the most telling thing that we saw was when AMD demoed a recent, um, I guess you could say, comparison against the GTX 950 where they were showing off Star Wars Battlefront at 60 FPS. Essentially, um, we have covered this just a few days ago, but I'll quickly run it over. Essentially, all they were showing, rather than, uh, I guess you could say, raw frame rates, they were capping the frame rate to 60 FPS, but what they were doing was showing that their new chip could run exactly the same, I guess you could say, frame rate with the same settings, as the GTX 950, but it was only consuming half the amount of power, which honestly is kind of crazy. It's absolutely massive improvements considering, uh, and it should really demonstrate where we're going, I guess, um, technology-wise over the next few years, which is really cool because obviously improvements to power consumption are not just beneficial to desktops, but also mobile graphics, consoles of course with we all know that AMD are going to most likely be providing excuse me the hardware for um, next generation Nintendo console the NX assuming it is called that and most likely they're at least being considered for the PlayStation 5 and the next generation Xbox as well and come on we all know that they are being developed somewhere in some room now, regarding Zen, she just simply reiterated that they were still on schedule for 2016. And once again, it is still high-end desktops and servers that they are targeting initially. Now, there is really good reasons behind that. Essentially, it comes down to PR. When it comes to PR, it's sometimes just better to say that you've got the fastest product rather than the best price performance product. This is one of the reasons that companies will release cards such as the Titan X, or the Titan Z, or the Radeon 295X2. Even if they're not the best in terms of value, even if they're not necessarily the best in terms of sales figures, what they do is say, hey, we are on top of the benchmarks, and that can be then used to shift further products, and it's also a good for in terms of mindshare as well. Now, of course, AMD at the moment are still pushing their APUs for, um, as I said, the PlayStation 4, the Wii U, as well as Xbox One. I think it's fair to say AMD have their fingers in a lot of pies. 
but she did point out that the consoles are now at around halfway through their lifespan. So let's face it, most consoles are going to last between five to seven years. There are some anomalies. For example, Xbox 360 was around 10 years old, which is kind of crazy. But typically a console lasts around five to seven years. So she pointed out that a refresh or a shrinkage of the APU, which is obviously just for power consumption reasons, this is where you'll get like a PS5 or sorry, a PS4 Slim or what have you. We've heard some rumours regarding that actually last year, but nothing really came of it. So it's potentially possible they could be doing that, and obviously that would mean that AMD would be able to leverage further contracts. Switching things over to high bandwidth memory 2 now, which of course is the upcoming memory specification, which we're going to be seeing in not only AMD's Polaris architecture, but also NVIDIA's own Pascal architecture. At the moment, we're seeing HBM1, which was lauded, I guess you could say, as the great saviour um, in such chips as the Fury X, the Fury, and the Nano, but it does have some problems. Primarily, yes, memory bandwidth has certainly improved over GDDR5, but it's not massive, massive, massive golfs of what you can already achieve with GDDR5, providing you're willing to put in enough uh, chips in there and use up enough power to power the damn things and of course have enough space in the PCB and secondly it does have that 4 gigabyte limit which is a bit of a problem now HBM2 does solve some of these so on the subject of memory bandwidth and this is per chip might I add GDDR5 to HBM1 uh, increased bandwidth by 400% from HBM1 to HBM2 per chip, once again, we're going to be seeing an increase of 100% on top of that, which of course is why we're going to be seeing one terabyte per second total for the, for example, Polaris architecture, which is absolutely crazy. Power consumption is next. So power consumption is quite simply how much energy do, does running the memory on a particular device gobble up. Now, obviously, in most cases the GPU itself is going to be the thing that sucks up most of the energy however that's not necessarily the thing that breaks the camel's back and memory can also be fairly hungry once again especially if you're putting a lot of GDDR5 chips on there so GDDR5 per chip to HBM1 per chip has a reduction in power of around 48%, which is pretty darn impressive. HBM1 to HBM2 is less impressive at around 8%. This is something that we've discussed at length before, and both NVIDIA and AMD have weighed in on this. Uh, Robert Halleck from AMD actually was discussing this in an interview with us, that, you know, it's all great to have GDDR5 to HBM1, but eventually even high bandwidth memory will have its limits, and of course that's when we're going to see the introduction in the future of yet better technology. The other core thing, of course, of HBM2 is it's going to be denser. So what does that mean? It basically means that per chip you're going to get more memory, which means, once again, for the next generation GPUs, we won't really be seeing 4 gigabytes, which was a big problem for the Fury. 4 gigabytes is fine for now, but 2 years, 3 years from now, it definitely won't be. And even such games as Batman Arkham Knight can really test the 4 gigabyte limits, particularly if you start to push up the resolutions. It's fair to say that Nvidia theoretically won't push 32 gigabytes for the average card for the Polaris architecture or um, the um, Pascal architecture, it's probable that we're going to be seeing just 16 gigabytes for home users. I mean, it's possible, I guess, for the Titan level cards that we might see 32 gigabytes, but it's most likely that they're going to be for workstation based GPUs. However, 16 gigabyte cards is certainly going to be pretty standard, and 8 gigabytes as well, depending once again where we get that cutoff that we were discussing just a while back. So the equivalent of, let's say, the GTX 970, for sake of argument, is that going to be high bandwidth memory? We're not really sure yet, and I guess Nvidia and AMD internally are doing some calculations to figure out, do those cards internally need that amount of memory bandwidth? and if it is, is it worth it in terms of cost? They're probably doing quite a lot of calculations. To be honest, we might also get this weird dual version of cards as well. 
which is something I have discussed before, which is very much like when SDR and DDR used to be together on the marketplace with, for example, the GeForce. Remember the original GeForce, where you could buy the GeForce SDR and the GeForce DDR versions of cards? It's happened with various other times in the industry as well. We could get, for example, GDDR3 and GDDR5 versions of GPUs. So we might have a situation like that where the HBM2 versions do have that slight price premium. Essentially, the cards will, I guess technically the very lowest capacity layer is just 512 megabytes. And technically we could just have one stack of that. So in theory, we could just have cards with very small, minuscule amounts of memory, which could potentially be used for, I guess you could say, APUs. But generally, most of the time, you're going to be seeing, of course, multiple stacks, multiple layers of them, which could push memory bandwidth all the way up to, for example, 512, 1024 gigabytes, depending, once again, on how much they really want to cram in there. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.